Good, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thanks so much to Michael and Sarah for inviting me here to speak. I'm Josh Rubner. I'm the policy director of the Institute for Middle East Understanding Policy Project, which is a 501c4 advocacy organization. You may be more familiar with our more longstanding sister organization, the IMU, the Institute for Middle East Understanding, which is a 501c3 nonprofit focusing on media issues and getting Palestinian voices into the media. We on the C4 side here in Washington, D.C. are more on the political and advocacy and uh, electoral side. So thank you so much for having me here today. I'm not going to speak for very long. I think it'll be more interesting for us to have more of a conversation together about what you might anticipate happening over the next couple of days in terms of your activism here in Washington, D.C. Of course, you're coming here to Washington, D.C. almost on the one-year commemoration of the October 7th Hamas attack against Israel, which killed 1,200 Israelis, and the genocidal violence that Israel unleashed subsequent to that attack that is ongoing, which has killed now over 40,000 Palestinians, including more than 16,000 children. Of course, the numbers do not do any form of justice to the inhumanity that's taking place as we see in Israel, denying Palestinians in Gaza access to clean drinking water, to medicine, to adequate levels of food, destroying schools, hospitals, most of the housing stock in the Gaza Strip, rendering almost everyone in the Palestinian Gaza Strip and internally displaced persons, sometimes displaced multiply on multiple occasions over the past 12 months. This, of course, doesn't even begin to recognize the horror that Palestinians in the Gaza Strip have been subjected to because of U.S. weapons, because of U.S. diplomatic support for Israel's infliction of genocidal violence against the Palestinian people. And you've just heard from the expert, and I would say a true patriot, <clears throat> Josh Paul, who knew the dysfunction of the U.S. weapons transfer process to Israel and resigned in principal protest yeah. over the Biden administration's policy of providing these weapons to Israel to kill Palestinians on a massive scale with our taxpayer dollars in violation of the laws that Josh so perfectly laid out. Now you might hear from your members of Congress well, October 7th, and that everything revolves around October 7th. But of course, we with a longer term perspective and commitment to the issue of peace and justice in the Holy Land know that history did not begin on October 7th, am I right? Really? October 7th, well, not in any way justifying what happened on that day, has to be set in its proper historical context. It has to be understood in the context of Israel's 57 years of brutal military occupation of the yeah. Palestinian West Bank, including East Jerusalem, yeah. and the Palestinian Gaza Strip. It has to be seen within the context of 76 years of dispossession of the Palestinian people from their homelands. Why is Israel a Jewish state today? Why is Israel a state that has a majority of its populations who are Jewish? The only reason why that is a reality is because Israel committed premeditated acts of vast ethnic cleansing yep. to drive Palestinians off of their land, out of their homelands, in 1948 when Israel was established. More than 80% of all Palestinians who lived in what became the state of Israel were driven from their homes and not allowed to return to those homes, despite international law guaranteeing everyone the right to return to their home for whatever reason and at any time they wish. Despite the fact that this being a precondition of Israel's admission to membership to the United Nations in 1949. Amen. We have to understand October 7th against the backdrop of what Palestinians 
referred to as an ongoing Nakba, an ongoing catastrophe. Because Israel's oppression, its apartheid system of rule over the Palestinian people has been a catastrophic form of oppression to which the Palestinian people have been subjected over the past three quarters of a century. Yeah. So while we can't minimize the crimes that took place on October 7th, and they were war crimes for sure in many cases, we also have to understand that Israel has been inflicting war crimes against the Palestinian people since 1948 on a continuous yes. basis. Yes, so if members of Congress want to talk to you about October 7th, you can engage them in that conversation, but also engage them in helping them to understand that if we want to prevent further violence, if we want to promote safety and security for all people who live between the Jordan River and the Mediterranean Sea, then we have to address the root causes of the issue which are ending Israel's apartheid system of rule over the Palestinian people, ending Israel's military occupation over the Gaza Strip and the West Bank, ending the separate and unequal discriminatory behavior that even Palestinian citizens of Israel are subjected to. And of course, and perhaps most centrally, allowing Palestinian refugees who have been denied their right to return for 76 years to finally go back home. Mm -hmm. These are the prerequisites for a just and lasting peace. So if politicians are concerned about the safety and security of all people between the Jordan River and the Mediterranean Sea, as they should be, you have to challenge them to address these core fundamental issues of what divides Palestinians and the apartheid state of Israel today. Now, Michael asked me to talk about the political context here in Washington, D.C. today. Look, the Biden administration has ostensibly been pushing for a ceasefire between Israel and Hamas since May 31st. President Joe Biden laid out in a televised speech a three-stage ceasefire negotiating process and press both sides to accept that ceasefire negotiating deal. This ceasefire negotiating deal would result in the exchange of hostages as well as the release of unjustly imprisoned Palestinians in Israeli prisons. It would result in the permanent cessation of hostilities between Israel and Hamas, and it would allow for the reconstruction of the Gaza Strip and a surge in humanitarian aid to the beleaguered population there. But what have we heard from the Biden administration since May 31st? We've heard repeatedly that only Hamas is to blame for the failure of these negotiations to bear fruition, to come to a successful conclusion. Folks, this proposal that the Biden administration outlined on May 31st was in substance the exact same proposal for a permanent ceasefire that Hamas had earlier communicated in that month. What is the obstacle? What is the problem? Why are the why is there no resolution to this issue? Why is there no ceasefire despite the Biden administration saying wrongly that they're working around the clock to achieve one? The reality is that Israel does not want a ceasefire. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That is the reason why there is no ceasefire. And in fact, the Israeli Prime Minister, Benjamin Netanyahu, has made it crystal clear to everyone that he wants to see a continuation of the fighting, even at the expense of the lives of Israeli hostages. This is why there are street protests, massive street protests in Israel. It's not to protest the Israeli government's starvation of Palestinians. It's not to protest the war crimes and crimes against humanity that Israel is inflicting on Palestinians. It's because Israeli Jews know that their prime minister is not doing everything he can to get those hostages back. So if your members of Congress talk to you about why it's so important to get Israeli hostages back home. 
have them pick up the phone and call the Israeli prime minister and tell him to take the deal, just like Israelis are demanding of him right now. Yeah. So let's be very clear. Israel continues to add condition after condition to these ceasefire negotiations to ensure that they will not come to fruition. The latest Israeli attempt to scuttle these negotiations takes the form of demanding permanent, permanent Israeli control over two key crossroads within the Gaza Strip. Number one is the Philadelphia Corridor. corridor. This, by the way, is a uh, no man's land that's actually empty and barren right now because during the second intifada, Israel raised hundreds if not thousands of Palestinian homes there in Rafah. And for those of you who remember Rachel Corey, yep. the American young activist who was run over by an Israeli bulldozer repeatedly and crushed to death while she was defending one of these Palestinian homes from being destroyed in Rafah, that's what created this Philadelphia border. Yeah. So now Israel insists that it wants to maintain a permanent military presence along this corridor between the Gaza Strip and Egypt. And not only that, the Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu is also demanding permanent Israeli control over what's called the Nitzarim Corridor, perhaps even more important than the Philadelphia Corridor. If I had a map, the Nitzarim Corridor basically bisects the Gaza Strip in two, running from Israel to the Mediterranean Sea. And it would allow permanent Israeli control to restrict the movement of Palestinians within the Gaza Strip. Does it bisect east to west? Bisect east to west, yeah. east to west. Okay. yes. And in fact, this was one of the main corridors of control that the Israeli military retained when the military occupation was within the Gaza Strip up until 2005. So understand that the Israeli prime minister is adding in these new conditions in order to scuttle the negotiations. This is why there's no peace deal. And let's be real. The Biden administration, through anonymous officials, leaked to the Israeli newspaper Haaretz a few days ago that there will be no ceasefire deal before January. There will be no ceasefire during the remainder of the Biden administration. Now, of course, we're also meeting, and you are here in Washington, D.C., as the risks of a broader regional war, a broader regional conflagration are very much at play. For the past 11 months, Israel and Hezbollah in Lebanon have been trading uh, artillery strikes and drone strikes and all types of exchanges across the Israeli-Lebanese border in a tit-for-tat that so far has not escalated into a regional war, although it has promised to, on a number of occasions, seeming. Many Lebanese, especially in the south of the country, are displaced from their homes as a result of these cross-border attacks, and many Israelis are also displaced from their homes in the north of the country. Now, pay attention closely, please, to what the Israeli Minister of Defense, Yoav Gallant, has said in recent days is the current aim of the Israeli government. It's to do whatever it takes to ensure that Israelis displaced from their homes can return to their homes. Israel is currently on, right now, a war path for an all-out war with Hezbollah. And let's be clear, the Biden administration does not want this all-out conflagration and war between Israel and Hezbollah. Yet, at the same time, the Biden administration will not do anything to prevent Israel from engaging in hostilities up to and including a full-scale war. Let's also be very clear. Hezbollah has a much more advanced military arsenal at its disposal than does Hamas. So there will be much more pain inflicted by Hezbollah on Israelis than Hamas is capable of including advanced weaponry that can reach Tel Aviv. So again, if your members of Congress are concerned about the safety of Israelis, again, they need to pick up the phone 
and they need to call the Israeli prime minister and they need to tell him he needs to get off of this war path and not escalate into a regional war. Because the consequences of an all out war between Israel and Hezbollah are very, very grave. The consequences could be very, very grave, especially if Iran jumps into the fray as well. We could be in a situation where we have an all out confrontation raising the specter of a nuclear confrontation even, raising the possibility that U.S. troops might become embroiled in Israel's wars of aggression. Just today, we saw the Pentagon announce that they sent more U.S. troops to the region to have Israel's back, should there be a broader war. So this is a very, very dangerous time. We've seen just in the past week that Israel has dramatically ratcheted up and engaged in provocations against Hezbollah by engaging in terrorism, by booby-trapping pagers and walkie-talkies that went off, oftentimes in crowded civilian places, injuring thousands of Lebanese civilians, killing children, killing dozens of people. And just over the past 24 hours, Israeli airstrikes on Lebanon have killed an estimated 275 Lebanese people. The danger of escalation, the danger of all out warfare is very, very real and needs to be stopped. Now look at the electoral calendar and take a page from history to understand how Israel likes to take advantage of these changes in electoral cycles in US politics to accomplish their goals. Today, there's a parallel between what happens between the lame duck administration of President George W. Bush before the inauguration of President Barack Obama. In the winter of 2008 and 2009, Israel engaged in a three week all out attack on Palestinians in the Gaza Strip known as Operation Cast Lead that up until that point was the most deadly single Israeli attack on Palestinians in the Gaza Strip. Why did Israel choose that time to launch its attack on Palestinians in the Gaza Strip? Number one, because it was the holiday season in the United States. And number two, because it was in this weird lame duck period where George W. Bush was still the president, but didn't really have that much authority left, and before Barack Obama assumed the White House. What's even more dangerous today in 2024 is the fact that Joe Biden is the lamest of lame ducks sitting there for four more months, knowing that his administration is coming to an end. And understand this about President Joe Biden. For President Joe Biden, Israeli-Palestinian issues are not political. I wish they were political because any rational politician would read the public opinion polls and say, we need a permanent ceasefire. We need an arms embargo on weapons to Israel because this is what the vast majority of Americans want, especially the vast majority of Democrats. But Joe Biden is not being political about this issue. Joe Biden is being ideological about this issue. And that means that it is impossible to change Joe Biden's perspective on what is taking place. Look, let me just tell you an anecdote. President Ronald Reagan in 1982 provided a lot of military, political, and logistical, and moral support for Israel's invasion of Lebanon that summer. But even Ronald Reagan grew so disgusted at seeing little Lebanese children with their arms and legs blown off by US weapons that he threatened Israel that if they didn't stop, he was gonna cut off the flow of weapons. So take that little fact to your Republican members of Congress <laughs> when you discuss things over the next few days. But this, I haven't seen these pictures and he doesn't care. And Tony Blinken has seen these pictures 
And he doesn't care because they're not approaching this from a political perspective. They're approaching this from an ideological perspective. Joe Biden often tells the story about when he was a little child, his father sat him down at the, at the family dinner table and explained to him what Europeans and the Nazis in particular did to oppress the Jews of Europe, culminating in the horrors of the Holocaust. And Joe Biden relates how his father told him that the state of Israel is what the Jews deserve because of that persecution. And Joe Biden tells the story about how that conversation with his father at a young age at the kitchen table solidified his identity as a Zionist. And you'll often hear Joe Biden talk about how he is a committed Zionist. And he is a committed Zionist. So we are going to have four more months of the continuation of this lockstep support for whatever Israel may do against Palestinians in the Gaza Strip and for whatever Israel may do in Lebanon as well. The policy will remain in place. And let's talk about the fact that President Joe Biden in August, the Congress was on recess and thought no one would pay attention, notified that there would be 20 billion dollars of weapons deliveries to Israel. I'm sure Josh talked about that in the previous session. $20 billion of weapons deliveries to Israel is a record amount of weapons delivered to Israel at any time since 1948. So even though Biden is the lamest of lame ducks in terms of the remainder of his administration, what can we expect from the results of the November 5th presidential election? Obviously the polls are very close and to try to predict the outcome would be foolish at this point. But let's look at the two scenarios. Either Vice President Kamala Harris gets elected or former President Donald Trump gets reelected. Let's look at VP Harris's record on this issue, serving as Joe Biden's vice president in this administration, and how she has dealt with the issue of Israeli-Palestinian issues on her very short campaign trail. At the Democratic National Convention in Chicago, the DNC refused to allow any Palestinian to speak, even though they invited the parents of dual Israeli American, uh, parents of a of dual Israeli American hostage, who was subsequently executed by Hamas, and it wasn't lost on anyone, by the way, that the most sympathy and the most empathy that was displayed for Palestinians at the DNC was by those Israeli American parents who spoke not just of their own plight, but of the plight of Palestinians in the Gaza Strip as well. Well, why wouldn't the Democratic National Party allow the Palestinian Americans to narrate their own suffering? Every single Palestinian American I know with connections to the Gaza Strip has lost dozens of relatives and friends over the past year. And we actually provided the DNC with plenty of names of amazing people who could speak to the issue, but they decided no. We heard Vice President Kamala Harris talk about freedom and self-determination for the Palestinian people at the DNC. And some of you who watched the speech may also have noted that this line gave her the most thunderous applause of any line at the DNC. This just goes to show the depth of support that exists within the Democratic Party for Palestinian human rights. Now, unfortunately, rhetoric is not enough. Kamala Harris saying she supports freedom and self-determination for the Palestinian people doesn't mean necessarily, we hope it does, but it doesn't mean necessarily that she's going to take the actions to enforce Israel to enable and allow these Palestinian human rights, which have been so long denied for more than three quarters of a century. And we especially know that words 
that are not backed by actions, especially when it comes to the issue of weapons to Israel, simply rings hollow. How can you say you're working night and day for a ceasefire, as Vice President Harris does, yet at the same time, not even be willing to commit to following U.S. law that Josh outlines when it comes to weapons transfers to Israel? How can you stand as the candidate of the rule of law and not commit to enforcing our own U.S. laws when it comes to weapons to Israel? So there's a lot of work that remains to be done with Vice President Harris. Yeah. Former President Trump. Look, a few months ago, he said, quote, let Israel finish the job. So whatever the downfalls of the dissonance between words and actions are with Vice President Harris, we know exactly where we stand on this issue with President Trump. We have to presume that when former President Trump says, let them finish the job, this includes everything up to and including ethnic cleansing and possible extermination. It is very difficult to see where President Trump would draw the line and say enough. There are certain red lines that the Democrats have put down that we as people and as a movement have forced the Biden administration to put down. I'm not talking about rough because that was a red line that was crossed with no consequences. But I am talking about the fact that early on last fall, the Biden administration sent a supplemental funding proposal to Congress that included many tens of millions of dollars to resettle Palestinians in the Egyptian Sinai Peninsula. <laughs> and we read that, we read the fine print of that proposal. We said, what? Is the Biden administration acquiescing in and supporting Israel's ethnic cleansing of the Palestinian people? And we put pressure on members of Congress who put pressure on the Biden administration to clarify that under no circumstances would they permit Israel to drive Palestinians into Egypt. So that was a real victory in terms of our people power to be able to force on this administration a red line that so far they have not allowed Israel to cross even though Israel wants to cross that red line too. How do things look in Congress? On the one hand, over the past two years, we've seen more assertiveness, more boldness among members of Congress, on the Democratic side only, speaking out in support of Palestinian human rights, undoubtedly. But at the same time, and this is the flip side, we've also seen how APAC has mobilized unprecedented amounts of money to try to enforce the status quo. We've seen how APAC pledged $100 million to throw into electoral campaigns this year to uphold the status quo of Israeli oppression and Israeli apartheid. And we've seen how APAC has even surpassed that fundraising goal of $100 million. And we've seen the dramatic impact that this money in elections has had knocking out some of our champions for Palestinian rights from their seats in Congress. Congressman Jamal Bowman of yeah. New York, Congresswoman Cori Bush of Missouri were defeated in large measure because of the unprecedented amount of APAC money that came into their districts to support their opponents. And you know what? Of the $20 million roughly that APAC spent to defeat Congressman Bowman and Congresswoman Bush, you know how many dollars of that advertising mentioned Israel? Zero. Why is that? Because APAC knows that advocacy for Israel is a losing issue amongst voters. That's why they have to disguise their presence. That's why they call their super PAC United for Democracy, which is a joke. Yeah. A joke because they have endorsed and given money to more than 100 Republicans who praised and helped facilitate the attempted coup and insurrection of Donald Trump, some democracy. Yeah. But they have to camouflage their name and take Israel out of the name of their super PAC so that when you see these ads paid for by 
United for Democracy Super PAC, right? There's no mention of Israel. So voters have no idea that they're being flooded by pro-Israel money with ads that have absolutely nothing to do with Israel. Your presence here in Washington is crucial. And I want to thank you all so much for coming because look, I can get up on the Hill. I can say these things to congressional staffers. I can say these things to members of Congress and they'll say, thank you very much. That was important and interesting information, but I don't really care at the end of the day because you don't vote for me. And that's how politics works. Yeah. And so you coming here to have these conversations with your members of Congress is much more crucial than anything that I could do or say up here on Capitol Hill. Now, I know you all are having a session later this afternoon where you're talking about your asks for members of Congress. Let me just throw a few things out there for your consideration. Josh already talked about Bernie Sanders introducing these historical joint resolutions of disapproval to block $20 billion in weapons to Israel. That may be introduced as soon as tomorrow. So you can ask your senators, it's not introduced yet, Here's the verbiage. You can ask them to be original co-sponsors of Senator Sanders' resolutions, or if it's already introduced, you can ask them to be sponsors. So original co-sponsors or sponsors, depending on when it actually gets introduced. If you're going up to Capitol Hill before tomorrow, Representative Adam Smith of Washington State has what's called a Dear Colleague letter that he is circulating calling for a U.S. investigation into Israel's killing of American citizen Aisha Noor Aigi a few weeks ago in the Palestinian West Bank. This letter now has 70 signers, at least it did as of Friday, it's probably picked up more since then. You can ask your members of Congress, both representatives and senators, to put their names on this letter, to sign this letter. It closes COB tomorrow when it gets sent to Secretary of State Blinken. And finally, just one last thing to put on your radar. Representative Andre Carson of Indiana introduced last week H.R. 9649. 9649. That's a bill to restore U.S. funding to UNRWA, the U.N. agency that for 75 years has provided needed social services to Palestinian refugees, wherever they may be in refugee camps, and whose funding is greatly hampering the delivery of humanitarian aid right now to Palestinians who are starving. This is the very least we can yeah. do, is to restore US funding to UNRWA to provide needed humanitarian aid to the Palestinian people. So these are some of the things that you can raise with your members of Congress. And again, I wanna thank you very much for your willingness to be here in Washington, to do what you're doing and to have these meetings. I hope I didn't talk too long. We got time for questions? Oh, yeah. sure we do. Yeah, All we've right. got until uh, 3.15. Uh, Sarah was going to moderate. Sarah, are you here? Yep, sorry, sorry. That's okay, please. Josh, thank you. Sure. Perfect. Great. Right. Uh, yes, go ahead. Yeah, so we're in the in the halls of Congress talking to staff or whomever, and uh, the dreaded word Hamas comes up. What about Hamas? Something must be done. These people, what they did on October 7th and all that, which I have recently done a little research on Hamas, which I should have done 20 years ago. And uh, I find that they have a record of being very different than their reputation. So how would you... Describe Hamas to a staffer who's like, "Well, Hamas, you know." If, or, how would you handle that that issue, Congressman? I'm an American citizen, and I'm concerned about what we have control. We have control over the weapons and the diplomatic support that we provide to Israel. We don't provide any weapons or any political support whatsoever to Hamas. I'm not here as a spokesperson for any Israeli or Palestinian political party. I'm here as a U.S. citizen speaking my concerns about what our foreign policy is. Mm -hmm. And you need to hold Israel accountable to U.S. laws. Because when they raise that issue, it's often as a red herring to divert you from what you want to say. So 
members of Congress and their staff, they're masters of doing this, right? So that's why you have to stick to your talking points. You have to take what they say and turn it on them in a way that you can get across what you came to talk to them about. Uh, and look, another way of attacking this is my organization, you know, we believe in human rights. We believe in international law. We believe that if someone commits a war crime or a crime against humanity, they should be held accountable for their actions. We very much believe in the post-World War II international structure of human rights that was set up to prevent the kind of atrocities from occurring again that took place in World War II. So what is this selectivity when it comes to accountability? Hamas has already been sued by the Department of Justice. And the Department of Justice has already sought the extradition of senior Hamas officials. Why can't we have the same thing for an Israeli soldier when they fire a sniper bullet to the head of an American citizen in the West Bank? Why is there no justice and accountability when an Israeli soldier murders Shireen Abu Akhla, a Palestinian American award winning journalist. So, these are the ways that I would turn it around. Let's have accountability, but let's not dispense it in a partial way. Let's make sure that all are held accountable for the war crimes and the crimes against humanity that are committed. But, how can we deal with terrorists, Islamic fanatics? Who would you know? Who decapitate people and who, you know? And they they turn in Hamas into ISIS. And you're supposed to, well, Americans believe ISIS, Al Qaeda, Hamas, Hezbollah, they're all the same kind of people. Yeah. Absolutely beyond the pale. We cannot cannot deal with. Them. Can we not say Hamas needs to be at the table because they are a force and they are supported. They have a power base. They cannot be destroyed and. We should talk, put them at the table and hold them to everything they should be held to. But this thing of just uh, leaving a black hole about a group that is uh, fighting yeah. <laughs> yeah. for their people yeah. uh, in whatever ways they choose. But still, I mean, is that uh, should we really just just let it go? Well, look, there's been five or six major, major uh, military confrontations between Israel and Hamas over the past 15 years or so. Every single resolution has been accomplished through a negotiated ceasefire between Israel and Hamas. There is no other way. There is no other way for there to be a permanent ceasefire. President Joe Biden has been negotiating indirectly with Hamas for many, many months to try to achieve a permanent ceasefire. So, you know, if a congressional office raises that point with you, that's certainly a red herring because, come on, the United States is engaged in diplomatic negotiation indirectly with Hamas to achieve a permanent ceasefire. And that's the only that's the only way we're going to get it. All right. Next question, Doug. Yeah, and maybe you answered this already, but again, I want to come back to your own sense of Vice President Harris. Somebody who you knows working up here, uh, just yeah, anything further, your own your own gut sense about where she might, you know, is she is she persuadable at all? I do think she is persuadable. I don't think she's Joe Biden when it comes to this issue. I don't think she comes to Israeli Palestinian issues from an ideological vantage point. I think she comes at it from much more of a cold, rational, political calculation, and I think that's much better. Uh, look, uh, Kamala Harris and Joe Biden are, are removed generation. Uh, Joe Biden is the product of post-World War II Christian guilt yeah. at what happened to the Jews under the Nazis in Europe. Kamala Harris is not a product of that generation. She's a product of a generation that has only seen Israel as a mighty conquering power and a military occupant. That doesn't mean that she's there with us. She's not there with us right now. That's for sure. But she's definitely not where Joe Biden's at on this question. And look, I think 
VP Harris reads the polls that we've all seen. We commissioned a poll among swing state voters in Arizona, Georgia, and Pennsylvania, three key swing state and three different regions of the United States. And we asked people, this was before Joe Biden passed the baton to Kamala Harris, would you be more or less likely to vote for the Democratic nominee for president if they supported a cutoff of weapons to Israel? And guess what? The results we found amongst Democrats and independents, for every vote, one vote that Kamala Harris would lose for taking that position, guess how many she would gain? Two. Five. Seven. Seven. Wow. The results were about 35% would be wow. more likely to vote for her, and about 5%, only 5%, would be less likely to vote. Wow. For her. So we shared 35 to 5. The three states, Arizona, Georgia, and Pennsylvania. And, just, and so we shared these results with the campaign. And we said, look, we're not gonna we're not gonna talk to you about morals. Because yeah. come yeah. on, that's not how Washington works. <laughs> yeah. We're talking to you about poll figures that are showing you that if you take this position, this is the path to victory. This is her path to victory. It's the path to winning back the millions and millions of Democrats who have been completely disaffected from Joe Biden's policies over the past year, who were disgusted by those policies. Um, and finally, I'll say one other thing. Look, who are the people around Joe Biden who are making the decisions on this call? And from everything that I've heard from people who are in the know, it's only these four people. It's Joe Biden, it's Tony Blinken, it's Brett McGurk, is Jake Sullivan on the National Security Council. These people are people with the ideological blinker on. They're, in some cases, Brett McGurk, I believe, served the Trump administration as well, if I'm not mistaken, on the NSC. And Brett McGurk, his priority is to get a Saudi-Israel normalization de uh, deal done. He doesn't care one whit about the Palestinian people. Contrast that with the people who are around Kamala Harris, Phil Gordon, who's her national security advisor, Ilan Goldenberg, who is his, her advisor on Middle East issues. These are people with detailed published records critical of US policy. These are people with published records of um, support for Palestinian rights and concern about the oppression of the Palestinian people. Look, I'm not gonna, fake it and say that like they would come up here and state things exactly how I stated them today, they wouldn't. They would state them very differently. But they are very, very different from the people surrounding Joe Biden. So the people around her are better, which is, means she's getting better advice. She's more of a political animal on this than Joe Biden is, which is to our uh, advantage. And I think there is room for a policy change under a Harris administration that we could not have under a Biden administration. Okay, we're gonna go with Don and then Brenda. Thanks, Josh. Great analysis as always. I got several questions for you, but one is you just referenced this, the Abraham Accords, which is kind of a neocon thing that Biden is committed to with the Saudi arrangement and Israel and security. Um, is Kamala less interested? You are hinting at that. And how could we approach it? Yeah. And the question I was originally going to ask you is, why has there not been an initiative for an international protective force yeah. for the Palestinians? Gaza is under siege. Pogroms are happening. Wouldn't that be of interest? Yeah. Uh, let alone in Gaza but at least in the West Bank to protect the villages because yeah. Palestinians are most vulnerable to anybody. Yeah. Um, okay. Defensive force, protective force, why is that not? So in regard to your first question, Don, the Abraham Accords, these were deals that the Trump administration struck with authoritarian and repressive Arab regimes 
throughout the country in order for them to get U.S. weapons and diplomatic support in exchange for normalizing relations with Israel. It was a bribe, plain and simple. It was a bribe. Uh, the UAE got advanced weaponry. Bahrain got advanced weaponry. Morocco got advanced weaponry. And they got U.S. recognition for its illegal annexation of the Western Sahara oh, yeah. out of the Trump administration. And Sudan, even though it didn't fully normalize, because it's, well, now it's in the state of civil war, then it was in this indeterminate transition uh, phase after dictatorship, Sudan got delisted from the, the U.S. list of countries supporting terrorism, right? <clears throat> so all of these countries got goodies from the United States for normalizing relationships. And of course, Saudi-Israeli normalization will be the crown jewel of that process. At first, the Biden administration was a bit reluctant to pick up on the Abraham Accords because they were so intricately tied to the Trump administration's policies. But they decided that, no, actually building upon the Trump era, Abraham Accords would be a positive thing. So there's no daylight there between Biden and Harris. They both want to see uh, Arab-Israeli normalization in general and Israeli-Saudi normalization in particular proceed. I don't think Harris would be uh, quite so unrealistic about it as Biden's team has been. They've prioritized the Israeli-Saudi normalization above almost every other regional issues, and they're kind of like tilting at windmills because Saudi's not going down that path, certainly not now. Um, in regard to your second question, why is there not an international protection force for the Palestinian people in the Gaza Strip? Or West Bank. Or West Bank, for that matter. Uh, in fact, in relation to the Gaza Strip, there actually used to be an international protection yeah. force yeah. for Palestinians in the Gaza Strip. It was called the UN Emergency Forces, yes. and it separated Israel from Egypt after Israel's attack on Egypt with Great Britain, France in 1956. That emergency force remained in place, protecting Palestinians in Gaza from 1956, or the aftermath of the war in 1957, to 1967 when Israel conquered the West Bank. Uh, the reason why there was an international protection force set up then was because you had superpower agreement that allowed it to pass through the Security Council of the United Nations. In order for the UN to establish an international protection force, it's a resolution that has to go through the Security Council. And of course, as we know, the United States can block anything it wants through its undemocratic veto power that we have, along with China, Russia, France, and Great Britain in the Security Council. So that's the reason why it's not even brought up as a potential in the UN because of the obvious UN, U.S. veto. Great, so it's not worth pressing with our Congress. The long shot. You can try <laughs> we have time for one more question. I know Brenda's had her hand up for some time. So go ahead, Brenda. So, uh, again, I'm from Atlanta, Georgia. I say this as a Harris supporter. She has real problems in Atlanta uh, regarding Palestine. Mm -hmm. And Palestine. that's why she's been there 12 times so far, last count. And on African American reparations and on that wealth building, not just on for no job, but corporate real ownership. Mm -hmm. She has not, to date, addressed the Palestinian community in Atlanta. Mm -hmm. She has not, to date, addressed the Palestinian community in Dearborn. <laughs> she has not do that. Her talk is surface, and that will not bring the boat out. So she has to come every day, every other day. She's got to make dig deep on those issues. I don't really see how policy in Britain looks like. It's just another language. Mm -hmm. What concerns me about Harris is that she wants to win mm -hmm. two terms. Mm -hmm. Maybe not ideological, but she, political. She wants to win two terms. She wants to win, win. There's no death in her issues. We bring that to her in terms of the African American community as well as the Palestinian community. So, I am concerned, as I stand here, whether she'll get Georgia, because she knows that these are issues, and it's not just talk. Don't give us the medical stuff. Give us something deep. 
I, I agree with your analysis, 100%. We'll put her out. What's that? We'll put her out. Uh, Georgia definitely, yeah, Georgia definitely could be what decided the election this year. And that, that's exactly why we, we commissioned that uh, public. Yeah, yeah. That, that's why we published that uh, fair commission, that public opinion poll, including in Georgia, uh, because it is so crucial. Absolutely. Um, but before we wrap, let me some merchandise. Yes, let me put in a plug. Uh, <laughs> maybe Michael, you can hold up hold up that T-shirt that you have there. Okay. So we have uh, merchandise left over from the DNC in Chicago, and I'm giving it away. I'm giving it. Please take as much as you want. Some of you may identify as Democrats, some of you may not. So I understand if you don't want to take it, but to say All right. Democrats for Palestinian human rights. Yes, how nice. And on the back it says, end weapons to Israel now. Good. And then we've got matching kafias. We've also got matching pins. Okay. Matching kafias and matching pins. So look, folks. That, those are big boxes out there. I don't want to take them back home. They don't do any good. They don't do any good sitting in my office at home. So please, please, please uh, take as much as you want. You will be doing me a huge favor in terms of bringing up room in my office. Thank you.